Well, hello, everybody. Welcome to Summit Church here in Fenton. So glad you've joined us today. Welcome everyone here in the congregation and everyone on social media. And uh, this is the day the Lord has made. We'll rejoice and be glad in it. What do you say? Hey, um, this message that I'm going to share with you today is part one of a, uh, of a two-part message uh, that I'll conclude next week. And, and there's going to be two different titles to it, but it's really one message, one message. And there's part of it that I need to share this week and then part of it that I need to share next week. And uh, uh, let, let's go to Mark, the sixth chapter, Mark, the sixth chapter and the 45th verse. Uh, the Bible says immediately Jesus made his disciples get into the boat and go before him to the other side to Bethsaida while he sent the multitude away. And when he'd sent them away, he departed to the mountain to pray. Now when uh, evening came, the boat was in the middle of the sea, and he was alone on the land. Then he saw them, his disciples, straining at rowing, for the wind was against them. Now about the fourth watch of the night, he came to them walking on the sea, and would have passed them by. And would have passed them by. Think of that. Jesus would have passed his disciples by. And I'm titling this message, Don't Let Jesus Pass You By. Don't Let Jesus Pass You By. And uh, actually we've had that on our church street sign for the past many months now. And... Uh, you know, letting folks know as they drive by our street sign out there and thousands and thousands and thousands and thousands of them a week. Maybe more than that. Maybe into the tens of thousands a week. Go by that sign out there. And, uh, and uh, we've always kept Jesus on that sign. If you've ever noticed over all these years, we've not put the little cute little sayings up on the sign. Sometimes, maybe once or twice we have. We'll advertise an event that we have going on at the church. But the Holy Spirit said to me years ago, he said, keep Jesus on that sign in the gospel message. And we've done that uh, for, uh, for decades now. 24 years. And uh, so right now, and for the past many months, we've had the title of this message, uh, Don't Let Jesus Pass You By, on that sign. And actually, this message today was my mom's favorite message that she ever heard me preach. And she heard me preach many, 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 many times. And I probably preached more to her, not here in the church, than I did in the church. But, uh, uh, but, uh, uh, this was her favorite message, don't let Jesus pass you by. Actually, I preached this message uh, at the second service that we had as a church back at Rockwood Summit High School in the Falcon Room all those years ago back in 1994. The first Sunday we just shared the vision of what God had given us to do. And then the second Sunday I preached, don't let Jesus pass you by. And, uh, and that will be this message today. It was the second message I preached uh, back in 1994. And it will be the second to last message that I will preach in this building. And uh, if that grabs you on the internet uh, uh, as a surprise, um, yes, it'll be the second to last message that I'll preach in this, in this building which we now occupy. And I'll, 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 I'll say more about that next week to you as to why that is. So you'll want to tune back in next week to, to find out about that. Now the first part of this message is, is pretty much the same as I preached uh, some 27 years ago. The last part of it is, is a bit different. Is a bit different. But, uh, but, but let's get with the first part of it. Why would Jesus have passed his disciples by? I mean, that's... I think that's a good question. And uh, now I'm not going to take the time to go back and go through all the, the, the verses uh, previous to this event right here where he would have passed them by. But if you took the time and went back in, the, in Mark's gospel account 
and, 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 and go back several chapters and read up to chapter 6 here, you would see that the disciples, now why would Jesus have passed them by? Well, the disciples had been sitting under the best teaching ministry this world ha had ever seen up to that time or ha has ever seen since. Jesus' ministry, his teaching ministry, it's, it's, it's matchless. Nobody can come close to it. They got to sit under that and listen to him teach. Jesus, on top of that, gave them in-depth explanations of his messages in private. Pretty cool, huh? And they got to partake of all of that. And then on top of that, they had observed Jesus' mighty miracles that he performed. Many mighty miracles that took place. And, and the disciples had been in a similar storm situation on the lake previously before this. This was the second time that they'd been in a precarious position and situation on the lake. And so with that being said, I believe one reason Jesus would have passed them by is that he expected them to put into practice what he had been teaching them. And they weren't doing it. And I think it's clear. And uh, you know, when, when, when the Lord teaches us things and teaches us things and teaches us things and, and we get to see his mighty power and he teaches us things and, and, and if we never put it into practice and all we do is sit there like a bump on a log and listen and never put it into practice, never adhere to it. We put ourselves in a position for him to pass us by. And uh, pastoring now some 27 years, and I can honestly say that, and I don't mean this ugly, but I would say that, I would say that, that, that of the teaching that I've done, I would say probably only about 25% of the people ever really put into practice what they heard me teach. So that means 75% just, just, just sat in the service, listened, and then went their way and paid no more attention to it. And of the 25% that did pay attention, uh, I watched those 25% put into practice what they heard me teach to various, to various degrees. And I would say just a very small portion ever really fully put into practice the teaching that they receive from the, this pulpit. And I think you'll find that's not unique with this church, but pretty well across the board. And, it, and, and the parable of, of um, uh, the sower that Jesus gave pretty well bears those uh, percentages out. But I want to say it again. If, if, if we don't ever put into practice what Jesus has taught us, then we put ourselves in a position for him to pass us by because it's clear from the teaching they received, everything that they had, had seen and observed. And you can see, if you read thoroughly here in, in, in these accounts, that Jesus expected them to use their faith and do something about that storm. And, and they didn't. And, uh, and he was, he, he was going to pass them by. Dear friends, don't ever let us put ourselves in a position where Jesus will pass us by. Now, if we go back to Mark 6, verse 48, I've already read it, but let's read it again. Then he saw them straining at rowing, for the wind was against them. Now about the fourth watch of the night, he came to them walking on the sea and would have passed them by. Now notice verse 49, And when they saw him walking on the sea, they supposed it was a ghost and cried out. Now, of course, Jesus then rescued them, so he didn't ultimately pass them by. How many of you know Jesus is gracious? Amen. And he is merciful? Yes. One other thing that we could say about this, that you can learn about Jesus, if you really study him and study the way he operated, he will not push himself off on anyone. Right. You understand that? 
And there's great truths we could say about that, but the main reason I believe he would have passed them by is because they weren't doing what they'd been taught and trained to do. And then another reason, which is, I think, very, very important, is found in the 52nd verse. And I'm going to read it in the King James Version because I think it brings it out more clearly to us. The reason he would have passed them by is they considered not, they considered not the miracle of the loaves. Remember I said to you they were sitting under his teaching ministry and they were sitting under his miracle ministry? And it said they considered not the miracle. They weren't esteeming it. They weren't giving it the attention that it deserved. It's very clear here. They considered not the miracle. They weren't esteeming what they were being taught. They weren't esteeming what they were observing. And they considered not the miracle of the loaves. And when you get yourself to a position where, or let me put it this way, when you don't esteem what God has given you, and you don't put utmost importance on it, you don't esteem it, you don't consider it, you don't value it. Eventually your heart is going to become hardened. Now I, I feel impressed to say that again. When you don't value what God has given you. When you don't value the gifts that he's given you. Esteem them and value them and appreciate them your heart will eventually become hardened, calloused, and cold. And reading from my notes here, I just want to say it again. Consider not the miracle implies the move of God had become commonplace to them. I remember the Spirit of God has moved in this church in days gone by in great and mighty ways and and, and people have been healed in this church over the past 24 years of every kind of thing you can, can, can almost imagine. Healing power of God sweeping through this place. Absolutely. And uh, I know one day I just took a whole service and went over all the testimonies, the healing testimonies. And, and one, one dear brother came up to me and he said, you know, Pastor Terry... He said, he said, you know, some churches don't even have one healing miracle to talk about. And, and I stood for almost an hour and gave one right after the next, one right after the next, one right after the next. You say, why haven't you seen the healing power of God moving and sweeping through this place lately? Well, over the past couple of years, things have to be esteemed. The things of God must be esteemed. I said the things of God must be esteemed. The healing power must be esteemed by a congregation as a whole. I said as a congregation, by a congregation as a whole. Yeah. And, and when the healing power of God is not esteemed and valued by a congregation as a whole, God will just stop flowing in that congregation. I've lived it. I've watched it. That's not to say individual people can't get healed and people can't be healed. I'm not saying that. I'm just saying the sweeping, moving power of God, if it's not esteemed, he'll stop flowing and, 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 and people will let that healing power pass them by. I've lived it. I've watched it. Again, if you don't esteem what God's given you, Uh, your heart can become cold, hard, and calloused. And uh, Jesus will pass you by. Let's look at a couple of people who didn't let him pass them by. Look at Luke, the 18th chapter. It's talking about Bartimaeus. He was blind. Remember him? 
In Luke 18, 35, then it happened as he was coming, as Jesus was coming near Jericho, that a certain blind man, of course, this man is Bartimaeus, the other gospel accounts tell us, and he sat by the roadside begging and hearing a multitude passing by, he asked what it meant. So they told him that Jesus of Nazareth was what? Was passing by. Here comes Jesus. He's passing by. He's passing by. And notice what Bartimaeus does. He cried out saying, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Then those who went before warned him that he should be quiet. But he cried out all the more, son of David, have mercy on me. Here's a man who's not going to let Jesus pass him by. Even though the other people around are trying uh, to, to, to shut him up and doing everything in their power to let Jesus pass Bartimaeus by. Bartimaeus is having none of it. He's going to just keep crying out and not let Jesus pass him by. Yeah. Glory to God. I want to be like Bartimaeus. How about you? And he cried out all the more, Son of David, have mercy on me. So Jesus stood still. And commanded him to be brought to him. And when he had come near, Jesus asked him, What do you want me to do for you? And he said, Lord, that I may receive my sight. Then Jesus said to him, Receive your sight. Your faith has made you well. And immediately he received his sight and followed him, glorifying God. And all the people, when they saw it, gave, gave God praise. You see, <laughs> Bartimaeus did not let Jesus pass him by. And he received his healing. I said he received his healing. I said he received his healing. Amen. Absolutely, he received his healing. And, uh, and he didn't let Jesus pass him by. Let's learn a lesson from Bartimaeus. Amen. And then uh, we could talk about so many, but just for the sake of time, remember Jairus. Yep. He came to Jesus. Jesus was passing by. He came to Jesus. Remember his daughter was sick. And he, he wanted Jesus to come back to the house and minister to his daughter. And about that time, as Jesus was headed that way, a woman, who, uh, a woman who had an issue of blood. Remember, there was a certain woman who had an issue of blood. Twelve years, had suffered many things and many physicians. Had spent all that she had was nothing better, but rather grew worse. When she heard of Jesus, she came in the press behind and touched his garment. For she said, if I may touch but his clothes, I shall be whole. And she touched him immediately. The fountain of her blood was dried up. And she felt in her body she was healed of that plague. Can you say amen? amen? See, she did not let Jesus pass her by. He, she came out there. Now, you know, it was illegal for her to be in public, you know. Because of that flow of blood. But she came out there anyway. And when she got there, she saw that large throng of people around him. And there he's passing by. But you know what? She pressed her way through that crowd, didn't she? Yeah. And she had made a decision in her heart that she was not going to let Jesus pass her by. And, uh, and, and I tell you what, she pressed her way through there. And she grabbed a hold of that garment. Praise God. And when she did, the power of God flowed out of him threw that garment into her, hit her, and, and, and did what the physicians couldn't do, uh, healed her. Can you say amen? Glory to God. But she didn't let Jesus pass her by. You see, if you're... It, and, and what I notice about Bartimaeus and this, this, this woman with the issue of blood is that they weren't going to take no for an answer, so to speak. I mean, they weren't, go maybe that's not the best way to say it. I mean, Bartimaeus, they told him to shut up. He wasn't going to listen to the crowd and take no for an answer, you know. He was going to press on. And this woman here, she could have become discouraged with the crowd. I can't get to Jesus. There's so many people here, this great mass multitude. But she wasn't going to let anything stop her. She was going to press her way in and not let Jesus pass her by. And I'll tell you what, if Bartimaeus hadn't have been the way he was, and if uh, the woman with the issue of blood hadn't have been the way she was, that Jesus would have passed him right on by. Absolutely he would have. Not because he didn't love them, but, but he was out there just going about his business and, and, and he didn't even know they were, they, were, they were in the crowd. You remember Jesus was 100% God, but he was also in his earthly ministry 100% man. And as man, he didn't know everything. Is that right? It's absolutely the truth. So Jesus was just going his way. 
Unless the Holy Spirit was to lead him, guide him, or direct him, there were times in his ministry where he'd say, you know, I must go this way. How many of you remember that, reading that? But other times he'd just be going about his business. But these people, as Jesus would pass by, Bartimaeus is a good example, a woman with the issue of blood is another good example. They were not going to let him pass them by. And then, of course, you have Jairus now. He's there waiting on Jesus concerning his daughter. And then in the meantime, word comes that don't bother the master anymore. Your daughter's dead. Remember that? And Jesus said, fear not, only believe. How many remember that? And, 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 and Jairus, now Jairus didn't let Jesus pass him by. And what do we learn from Jairus? Patience. Patience. He could have got uh, disgruntled because, you know, Jesus was headed over to his house, right? And, 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 and then he got interrupted with the woman with the issue of blood. And J.R. could have, you know, he could have got, he could have got disgruntled. He could have got upset. He could have become impatient and all of that. Uh, he could have walked away. Is that right? He could have walked away. And, and, and particularly when the word came, now she's dead. I mean, he could have been really upset. Well, if the woman with the issue of blood hadn't got in here and interrupted things, he, Jesus might have got over there in time. But you know what? Bartimaeus kept a good attitude. Now, let me tell you right now, if you don't want Jesus to pass you by, you better keep a good attitude. He passes by people with bad attitudes. I'll tell you again, Jesus will pass by people with bad attitudes. Grumblers and complainers. Huh? He'll pass them by. Backbiters, gossips. I could go on and on and on. He'll pass all those people by. He just will. But you know, uh, Jairus didn't didn't act... uh, act unbecomingly in any way, shape, form, or fashion. As far as we know, he just stood there and he waited, and then now his daughter's dead, but now Jesus said, fear not, only believe. And then they went over to the house, and Jesus raised the daughter from the dead, and ultimately Jairus didn't get passed by either. Glory to God, that's exciting. But now, and so many others we could talk about, but let's look at one person who did let Jesus pass him by, and we could talk about many people who who did let Jesus pass them by, but I just want to center in on one right here, Mark the 10th chapter. And in the 17th verse, talks about the rich young ruler. Says, now as Jesus was going out on the road, one came running, knelt before him and asked him, good teacher, what shall I do that I may inherit eternal life? And then, of course, a conversation ensues about the commandments. And, uh, and, and the young man thought he had kept the commandments. And if you read into it and study it out, we see that he didn't even keep the very first commandment, you know, which is to keep God first. Is that right? Have no other gods before him. And, um, and you'll see why as we read on here uh, that he didn't even keep the first commandment. Now notice here, then Jesus looking at him, loved him and said to him, one thing you lack, go your way, sell what you have, give to the poor, you'll have treasure in heaven and come take up the cross and follow me. But he was sad at this word, now watch this, and went away sorrowful. He, he walked away from Jesus. I said he walked away from Jesus. Did he let Jesus pass him by? Absolutely he did. He let Jesus ultimately pass him by. He went away. He walked away from Jesus sorrowful for he had great possessions. And and really, we need to understand the possessions had him. And we know they had him because he couldn't turn loose of them at the direction of the Lord. But the point here is, is he let Jesus pass him by. Because of his possessions. And then verse 23, Jesus looked around and said to his disciples, How hard is it for those who have riches to enter the kingdom of God? And the disciples were astonished at his words. But Jesus answered again and said to them, Children, how hard is it for those who trust in riches to enter the kingdom of God? Nothing wrong with having riches. It's wrong when riches have you. And you can know that riches have you if you can't turn loose of them when the Lord tells you to. Do you understand that? And so, because of these riches... And trust not the riches themselves, but the trust. You can see this young man was trusting in riches. He was trusting in his finances. He was trusting in all the things that he had. And as a result of that, he let Jesus pass him by. Again, nothing wrong with having riches. How many of you know Abraham was rich, wasn't he? And Abraham's in heaven. We know that. Read Luke, the 16th chapter. You can see that. It wasn't the money... Itself, it was the trust. Where's the trust? Abraham had money, but his trust was in God. His faith was in God. This man had money, but his trust wasn't in Jesus, in God. His trust was in his money. And so, 
We have to watch the cares of this world. We have to watch the deceitfulness of riches and the desires for other things entering in and choke us all up. And as a result, we let Jesus pass us by. Again, I've pastored for 27 years so far. Not finished yet by any means. Amen. But uh, 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 27 years and I have watched this for all that time. So many people let Jesus pass them by because of the cares of this world. And the deceitfulness of riches, the desires of other things. I've watched it again and again and again. The desires of other things, other things more important than the work of God. I've watched it for 27 years. So many people, not all, but so many. I learned this long time ago that most Christians love a whole lot of other things more than they love Jesus. That's a sad report, but that's a report that, one report that I have. Very sad. Took me a long time to Took, took me a long time to, I just couldn't believe it as we began pastoring and over the years as they came and went that I watched people, Christians, people that are born again. They, they, they are saved, all right. But they love, they love so many other things far more than they love Jesus, even sports teams and other things. And you know, you think about this rich young ruler, he walked away from Jesus and Jesus said that one who trusts in riches cannot trust in riches, cannot enter the kingdom of God. We have no record that this young man ever came back. And based on the record that I have, he walked away from Jesus, could not enter the kingdom of God. So guess where he is today? He walked away from Jesus and he's in hell right now. Gets real serious all of a sudden, doesn't it? Now, go to Mark and we could look at others who let Jesus pass them by. But I want to I get to these next two things before I go into the close of my message. Look at Matthew 11. Let's look at, uh, 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 did, you know, did you know not only people can let Jesus pass them by, but whole city, cities can let Jesus pass them by. Now watch this here, Matthew 11, verse 20. Then Jesus began to rebuke the cities in which most of his mighty works had been done because they did not repent. Woe to you, Chorazon. Woe to you, Bethsaida. Now, underline Bethsaida. We're going to come back to that. Woe to you, Bethsaida. For if the mighty works which were done in you had been done in Tyre and Sidon, they would have repented long ago in sackcloth and ashes. But I say to you, I'll be, it will be more tolerable for Tyre and Sidon in the day of judgment than for you. And you, Capernaum, uh, uh, who are exalted to heaven, will be brought down to, to hell. For if the mighty works which were done in you had been done in Sidon, or uh, done in Sodom, it would have remained until this day. But I say to you that it shall be more tolerable for the land of Sodom in the day of judgment than for you. Think about that. What do you have here? You have these cities, Chorazon, Bethsaida, Capernaum, and where most of his mighty works had been done, and they did not repent. They See, they didn't esteem what they were seeing. They didn't value what they were seeing in those mighty miracles that Jesus did in those cities. And Jesus pronounced a woe or a curse on them. And those cities let Jesus pass them by. So it's not just that a, it's not just that a person can let Jesus pass them by, but a whole city can let Jesus pass them by. And I'll tell you what, a whole church can let Jesus pass them by. And maybe not everybody in that church, but when I say a church, I'm talking about the congregation as a whole. You understand that? And look at Mark, the eighth chapter, to, to, to give you a little more on this. Remember, I said, remember Bethsaida. Watch this in Mark 8, 22, because Mark 8, 22 happened later on after Jesus did his mighty miracles in these cities. From my study of it, look at Mark 8, 22. Then he came to Bethsaida. And they brought a blind man to him and begged him to touch him. So he took, now watch this, he took the blind man by the hand and led him out of the town. 
And when he had spit on, on his eyes and put his hands on him, he asked him if he saw anything. And he looked up and said, I see men like trees walking. He put his hands on him again and made him look up. And he was restored and saw everyone clearly. Well, watch this. Then he sent then he sent him away to his house saying, neither go into the town. Don't go back into Bethsaida, nor tell anyone in the town. Riveting, riveting statement there. Why? Why did Jesus say this? Because he had gone to that town. He went into that city of Bethsaida. Mighty works were done. They rejected him as a whole. And now this one man wants to get healed. And so Jesus takes him out of the town, heals him and says, says to him, don't go back there. And don't tell anyone in the town. Now much we could say about it, but I think it's clear. See, Jesus was there, he offered his blessing and his gifts and all of that, and they rejected him, and he was done with them, and he passed them by. And they let him pass them by. Do you see that? Yeah. And he was done. He was. You know, God can get done with something and be done with it. We don't ever want to get there. But, 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 but some people do, and some groups of people do, some churches do, some cities do, towns and God's done with it. I'm not saying that the individual people might repent and want to get back right with the Lord and God's gracious and merciful, but he can get done with something and be done with it. I remember a small city right here in the suburb of St. Louis, Times Beach, Missouri. Yeah. And what a lot of people don't know about that, because that place has been shut down for decades. But what a lot of people don't know about that is God sent a pastor, a pastor that I used to assist many years ago. He's in heaven now. But God sent a pastor to pioneer a New Testament church in that town, in that city, where the uncompromised word of God was taught and the Holy Spirit was free to manifest himself and the city as a whole rejected that pastor and rejected that church and rejected the move of the Holy Ghost. And God supernaturally shut that church down at that location and reassigned that church and that pastor and his wife to another location. And then after that, God judged that city and shut the entire city down. And that city, Times Beach, Missouri, let Jesus pass them by. All those years ago, see, you heard on the news how that place was shut down. And I could get into all the details of it. But what you don't hear on the news is that God sent a man and, a, and his wife there to bring the move of God there. And that city rejected it. And God shut that church down in that location, reassigned that pastor and his wife and that church to another location, and then God shut the city down. You see, God can shut a church in a community down like the one I just mentioned. You know, God can set a pastor called of God and anointed by God in, he, in a church. He can set a church in a community with a pastor in that church who's called of God, anointed by God. A pastor who is anointed to teach the uncompromised word of God with clarity and with power and great authority. Where the gifts of the Holy Ghost are in operation, the word of wisdom, the word of knowledge, the discerning of spirits, Diverse kinds of tongues, interpretation of tongues, prophecy, and that pastor can stand under the anointing of God and, and prophesy by the Spirit of God and, and prophesy things concerning the nation. And it comes to pass with cold-blooded accuracy. The working faith and working of miracles and gifts of healings and healings by the multitudes. And God can set a church in a community with a pastor that will flow with the Holy Ghost in the way I just described. A pastor that handles money properly and doesn't bilk people out of their money 
and financial blessing can be seen upon that local church. Missions and the poor are helped greatly by that church. God can set, a, can set such a church in a community that way. And God, on top of that, can set a godly anointed wife by that pastor's side that goes beyond the call of duty to see to it that the church runs like a fine oiled machine. Like a fine oiled machine for God. In all areas, including worship and socials and every other way you can imagine. He can set, set such a fine lady beside a pastor in a church in a community. And that pastor and his wife can love the people that God assigned to their church. And that pastoral couple can counsel those people and visit them in the hospital when they're sick and help them financially when they can't make a car payment or a house payment and send the people of that church cards on special occasions and, and look out for them and watch out for them in every way, shape, form, and fashion you can imagine with the only demand being made on the people by the pastor, the only demand that the pastor makes on the people is to keep Jesus as the main focus in their life. Keep Him ahead of anything else, including sports teams, political figures, and even donuts. <laughs> but over time, Christians assigned to God, assigned by God, over time, Christians assigned by God to that church and that pastoral couple can be like the disciples in the boat, and consider not the gift that God has put in their midst. I'm talking about a congregation as a whole. And they can take that pastoral couple and that church for granted and not esteem it, not value it, not value the healing power of God that flows through it. And in the process of time, their hearts can grow cold and calloused and dull. And hardened like what happened to the disciples. And those people can eventually walk away from that church and that pastor and his wife. And since they are representatives of Jesus, that congregation in that way can let Jesus pass them by. Not a loss of salvation, but a loss of all that God had for them. And that church can be set in a community by God and that church can even position a street sign at a busy intersection and at the direction of the Holy Spirit keep the name of Jesus and the gospel message on that sign for decades telling all who pass by how to miss hell and make heaven Amen. and mass multitudes of cars over decades of time with lost sinners at the wheel and other lost sinners as passengers drive by that street sign sometimes twice daily thousands and thousands of times over decades and then one day those people die and arise in judgment before God and as they're sentenced to an eternity in hell, cry out to God and say, You never told me about Jesus and the gospel. And I believe God will answer them by saying, I put a church. And we'll call the name of the church. At a busy intersection. And we'll call the street names of that intersection. And we'll tell those people you drove by that sign and give them the exact number of times they drove by it and the exact gospel messages that were put on it. You drove by there daily, almost daily for decades. And I believe God will say to them, you paid no attention to it. And you let my son Jesus pass you by. And they miss heaven and go to hell. 
leaving Jesus pass them by. And if that church that God sets in a community, such as I've described here, is neglected and rejected, I'm going to say it again, if that church and that pastoral couple is neglected and that gift that God has set in them and in that church is neglected and rejected by a congregation and a community, a congregation as a whole and a community as a whole long enough over decades of time, sometimes God will close that church at that location and reassign it and reassign that pastor and his wife somewhere else where they are esteemed and where people appreciate those gifts, just like the church I mentioned a bit earlier. Sobering, isn't it? Yes. Yes, it is. I said it's sobering, isn't it? Now I have much more to say. This is uh, the first half of what I need to tell you. And next week I'll share some things on Facebook I haven't set up to now. But now the Holy Spirit wants me to share some things next week with you. As we move into our last service in this building. In this building. Summit Church will continue, but next Sunday will be the last service in this building. Pastor Diane and I, Summit Church will continue on. But next Sunday will be the last service in this building. And we'll pe preach part two of it, of this message next week. And, I'll, and I've never done this before that I can recall, but I'll give you the title ahead of time. It's titled Supernatural Openings and Closings. I said Supernatural Openings and Closings. And I think, uh, I think you'll want to hear it, what the Holy Spirit's given me to say next week. So we'll talk about how God opened this church and then, and then the rest of it. If you're out there today, I want to say this to you. If you're listening and you've never accepted Jesus Christ as your Savior, I want to tell you, He's passing by right now. He's passing by. Whether you're watching me live or you're watching me down the road somewhere, He's passing by. Don't let Jesus pass you by. Cry out to him right where you're at. Repent of your sins. Cry out to the name of the Lord. Cry out to Jesus. Invite him into your heart. And he'll come in there. You'll miss hell. You'll make heaven. You'll make your life worth living in the meantime. Whatever you do, don't let Jesus pass you by.